I think this topic should be interesting to everyone, uh, but it's good to see that you have chosen to make this a priority. You know, we are, I think, in general, interested in origins, our own family origins, uh, especially. Um, there are many people who do genealogical research. So I think, you know, understanding our origins, understanding our background affects who we are and what kind of choices we make in the future. Today we'll be looking at um, the great question of where do we come from? And I think this also impacts our understanding of where we're going. It really impacts our understanding of some of the larger questions in life. And so my hope is that this will not just be an intellectual discussion for you, but it will be a, a personal exploration because these questions that will be looked at today have implications for our personal choices. The dominant view in academia today is really evolution. Uh, but that has not always been like that. And we really want to look at the question of, you know, does science and reason necessarily oppose a belief in creation and a creator? Do they inevitably lead uh, to the idea of evolution. Does creation stand a chance in light of today's uh, understanding? So we're going to be exploring some of these questions. Um, I would just like to introduce our speaker. I'm so excited and so glad that Dr. Brand has taken the time from his very busy schedule to be here with us, uh, together with his wife, Kim. Uh, they've traveled all the way from California, and just recently he was in India, where he was lecturing in India, and he travels throughout the whole world lecturing. Um, Dr. Leonard Brand is professor of biology and paleontology in the Department of Earth and Biological Sciences at Loma Linda University. He received his PhD at Cornell University in 1970 and has been on the um, Loma Linda faculty since then. He teaches courses in paleontology, vertebrate biology, and philosophy of science. His research focuses mostly on the processes of fossilization and the geological factors that influence preservation of fossils. He has published over 35 scientific research papers and numerous articles. He has published four books, which have been translated into one or more other languages. He has received a Zapra Award for Distinguished Teaching a Best Student Paper Award at National Meetings, and a Distinguished Service Award from Loma Linda University. His strongest long-term interest has been developing a Bible-centered approach to the integration of faith and science. He has a wife and two grown children who have endured many of his research trips. Um, he brought with him two of his books, and he'll talk more about these books later on. I just wanted to show you to start with. Uh, one of them, which is called Faith, Reason, and Earth History. Now, this is really designed as a textbook and is a very thorough uh, look at the issues. Um, so he will talk more about this, but I want to also say that you can get this for free online. So uh, make sure that you're paying attention when he tells you how to do that. And then another small book is called Choose You This Day, Why It Matters What You Believe About Creation. This is a book that he wrote together with somebody else. And actually, he wrote this one, too, together with somebody else. So you have a real passion, uh, Dr. Brand, for teaching. And uh, you have invested your whole professional life, really, in this topic, in this area. I'd like to have a short word of prayer and just ask mm -hmm. for God to be here with us today. Dear God in heaven, uh, we just thank you that we're able to learn and that you are the God of knowledge. And I pray that you would lead our own minds so we can better comprehend these deep and important issues. Thank you that you will help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, Dr. Brand. Thank you. It's uh, delightful to be here in, in beautiful Oregon. Um, you, know, you have all, all these green things on your hills. I think you call them trees. We don't have many of those in Southern California. So I, I enjoy Oregon. And I'm going to talk about tonight about rocks. Now, we're, the, real, the overall issue we're interested in is origins, which involves um, evolution over millions of years. 
But there's the biological part, and we're going to talk about that a bit later this weekend. We're going to start off with the geology, which has a lot of implications for the amount of time um, for, for life to be on this earth. Which is an important aspect of it, that the biology and the geology go together, and you can't really separate them. Uh, so we're going to talk about rocks, and I, I need to give you a, a little introduction I'm sure most of you are not geologists, so I'll give you a little introduction to, to the geological aspects. So this will be a 10-minute course in uh, physical geology. You won't get college credit for this, but you also don't have to pay tuition. So um, the, the rocks that we're going to talk about are, are, are sedimentary rocks. And these are sediments are mud, sand, gravel, all these kind of things that can be carried by water and deposited someplace. But generally by, by flowing water. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And here we have, for instance, the, uh, the Russian River, I think it is, coming into the ocean. And you see the color difference? Because this water is full of mud. And it's depositing layers of mud on the bottom here. And here's a river uh, that has deposited these layers, tremendous layers of mud. And so those are sediments being deposited in layers. And ultimately, this, this is a process that makes all of these layers uh, of rock that you see here in the Grand Canyon. Now these are, these lines you see, those are not lines on, on a face of a cliff. Those are all layers that go back into the rock, just like slices of bread. They're, they're, the layers go back uh, maybe hundreds of miles in, into the hill. And so these are layers of mud that have been deposited. So in the, there are two overall stages in geological processes. One, you deposit these layers of rock, forming the rock layers. And then once you've deposited them, like you see here, then you erode them, shaping the landscape. So these layers used to cover this entire area, but erosion has removed a lot of it to form the, the canyon. So we've got depositing the layers, and then eroding them to shape the landscape. And those are both, both very important. And we're going to begin primarily with the depositing process and then get to erosion after a bit. So, so why are we here? I mean, what's the basis of the gospel? Is it geology and, and biology? No, it, it's the love of our, of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave everything for us and loves us. So why do we spend time on this? Well, science claims to have shown the Bible is wrong. And some of us are, are tired of having friends give up on the Bible or on the gospel because they think science has proved all of this wrong. And the more I study it, the more I realize, no, science has not that, done that at all. So let's, uh, let's talk about it. First of all, uh, two general views of earth history. And these are world views. Your, your pastor in his introduction talked about where we came from uh, where we're going. These are these are things that make up part of your worldview, how you see life and the world around us. And it also has a lot to do with what lots of little things that we notice or don't notice. And so those are worldviews or philosophies. There's a conventional geology, which is what most people believe. Millions of years for life on Earth. Uh, life is a result of evolution. Rocks have formed by processes we see happening today. Rivers, floods, ocean currents carry these sediments and deposit them slowly over eons of time. The biblical worldview says it's only thousands of years, not millions. Life was created, and there was a global flood catastrophe, a geological catastrophe that we can study geologically, and we want to understand um, all of that. So we're going to talk about how long does it take to form and erode the rock record. So we're interested in, in time. And we'll look at evidence favoring short time and global flood and evidence challenging that point of view. So we don't have all the answers. If you came to get all the answers, I'm sorry, can't give you all the answers. Uh, we don't know all the answers, but there's, there is a, um, we'll look at both types of evidence uh, and summarize what's going on here. And especially look at where is the evidence, as we look at, get to gather more evidence, where is it going? What is it showing? Okay, so we'll look, first of all, you might say the bad news. What's the evidence we don't have answers for? Uh, and we can address this by asking, why do so many geologists 
believe in the geological time scale, millions of years. What, why do they believe this? Well, the biggest line of evidence is, is radiometric dating. You can take these rock samples, especially when they are, and primarily when, when they are uh, uh, volcanic sediments. You can date those, um, and you make certain assumptions. Collect your data, make certain assumptions, and calculate an age. And for most people, they consider those to be in terms of hundreds of millions of years. So this is a good reason why scientists believe in those long ages. But it's not only that. There are really two important things that go together here. And the second one is the one that is, is very poorly understood by most people. Uh, you know, I've heard scientists say, well, you know, religious people have faith. Science, you have evidence. The not, faith is not involved. Well, that's, that's a very poor description of the way things work. There are two factors here involved in how scientists believe what they believe, usually. You have evidence, like the radiometric dating, but then there's the worldview or philosophy. Um, your worldview influences how you interpret what you see, and it has a very profound uh, influence. The worldview or philosophy of most scientists is methodological naturalism. Naturalism means we will interpret, interpret everything only by the laws of chemistry and physics. God better stay out of the picture. Okay, that's naturalism. You will not ever accept the idea that there was have ever been anything supernatural. No creator, nothing like that. And so that's, that's, that worldview that most scientists work under is based on that assumption. And that's a very dominating, uh, important assumption. Naturalism requires millions of years for the evolution of life. If you're going to, whether evolution can work, at the, the, the big scale evolution, whether that can work at all, is something we'll talk about later. But if it does, it will require many millions of years, at least. And so this philosophy uh, interprets everything that way. Is there other evidence besides that radiometric dating? Well, yes, there is. But how it will be interpreted depends on, uh, to a large extent, this worldview. You look at their, go out there and look at the rocks, and they don't tell you it took this many years to form me. You gather evidence, and then you interpret that. You decide what that evidence means. And every scientist, everybody, has a worldview, which has a very important influence on how they will interpret the evidence. And if you take this... Uh, um, the, the naturalistic worldview, you add that to the, to the evidence, and all evidence will be interpreted by the naturalistic worldview. All the evidence will be interpreted to indicate long ages, whether it really has to be interpreted that way or not. Okay, now this, many Christians do not understand the dominating role of naturalism in origins, and I'm not just Christians. Most people, including the scientists who follow the naturalistic view, don't understand the role of, of worldviews, of philosophy. And so this is the, big, the part that really is generally not understood, how, how that, um, how, what that role that has. In the study of origins, ancient history, assumptions rule. <laughs> if you follow naturalism, you have no choice but to interpret things, and you will always interpret things in terms of long ages of time. Uh, because you, you cannot... If you accept naturalism, you can't, as one philosopher put it, let a, let a divine foot in the door. You cannot let the possibility of creation uh, come into the picture. But um, there is an alternative, okay? And we're going to ask now, if you take the naturalism worldview out of the picture, if you remove that, does the evidence really indicate long ages? Uh, that's our big question tonight. And actually, there is a very real alternative. Much of geological evidence is not compatible with those millions of years. So we've got the bad news that we don't have answers for, the radiometric dating and some other things we don't have really time to get into. But there's the other side. There's a lot of evidence that we'll talk about tonight that is just not compatible with those long ages of time. So worldviews and interpretations. Each worldview makes predictions of what research will discover and it determines how it's interpreted. 
So there's a biblical prediction we can make, and that is just a general view. Accumulating evidence will favor short time and or catastrophic processes. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about whether that works. Does it work? Yes, absolutely it does. Okay, so look now at the good news. This evidence that, that uh, supports a biblical worldview is, is difficult to reconcile with long ages. And there's examples. We won't talk about archaeology, but there's growing support for biblical accuracy. We're going to get into this part tomorrow. Uh, biology, the Darwinian theory, uh, frankly, is collapsing. From a scientific point of view, it's collapsing, and I'll show you why. And now we're going to talk about tonight about geology, growing evidence that doesn't fit the long time scale. Okay, and reviewing again these, these different these, these two theories. Conventional theory, ancient events must be explained by processes seen or feasible in the modern world. And I'll show you examples of those. Things that can happen today are assumed to have always been the same processes through time. But the biblical worldview says ancient events were probably quite different. A geological catastrophe. Um, and we think Noah was involved with that. But unfortunately, he, he wasn't taking notes. So we have to do a lot of work to try to figure it out. Okay, what are these modern processes? You have uh, rivers that carry sediment. And I showed you an example of that. You have here a different kind of stream called a braided stream, carrying sediments and gravel and depositing it. Uh, sediments get deposited in lakes. So these are modern processes that deposit sediment. And we're going to look at now, are those adequate to explain the rocks that we'll look at? Okay, here's a, another example. This is a picture back east here. This is the Mississippi River. And this is what we call the flood plain. You see there's a distinct difference along here on both sides. This is kind of normal landscape with streams and rivers and farms and all the rest. This is the river floodplain. And so the river is this big right now. In the past, it's been bigger and it's been wandering back and forth. As this, as this river flows, when it comes to flood time, it'll start to cut away the banks and take a, make a new channel. And here you can see some of the old river channels, uh, the old bends in the river. So this is the, the, the valley in which the river has been mar migrating back and forth through the centuries. We call that the floodplain. If you want to build your house, probably don't build it on the floodplain because the river is going to come back there sooner or later. So this is, this is what the modern process is doing. This is what it's been doing over centuries. And so keep this in mind as we look at rock layers later. And you notice this floodplain is about, um, about nine kilometers about maybe five, six miles wide. Okay, that's how big it is. It gets wider farther south, but it's always in this belt uh, of land along the river. All right, so that's what happens today. Now let's look at the ancient rocks and see if that seems compatible with those river processes. Here's some pictures up in, in Utah. And notice this, this cliff here. This is, that cliff is about a thousand feet high and it's not, a, it's not a cliff because of a fault that has moved the rock from down. It's just, it's a cliff there. This rock formation used to extend way out here, and it's been eroded away. And like I say, up to about 1,000 feet high. And this is called 50 Mile Mountain. Because this cliff, it goes around the corner a little bit, but it's about 50 miles long. And I've, I've flown with a helicopter all the way down along this cliff. And these rocks are amazingly continuous for 50 miles. Does that look like a, a river that we see happening today, uh, depositing this? Well, I suppose you could have the river that had just happened to flow right along here, but it isn't that way. This goes perhaps 100 miles back into the hill, the same. Okay, and here's another, another part of Utah. Um, picture taken from quite a ways away. And so you have um, some rock formations here with red rock. Then you see some formations with white rock and then more going on up to um, pink rocks at the top. That's called the Grand Staircase, and we'll talk about that a little more later. But, uh, you know, this take this layer right here. That's one layer of, of sedimentary rock, one formation. And here it looks like it's very irregular going up and down. That's because we're looking up at it. 
And so you see the bumps going up. But if we get up higher and look right, right across the top of it, of this very same layer, it's a very flat uh, sandstone layer up to 1,000 or even 2,000 feet thick. If you've ever been to Zion Park, this is what you're looking at. Okay, so sand, 1,000 to 2,000 feet thick. Uh, a, a single layer, a uniform layer going 300 miles in this direction. Zion Park is right over in there. And if you, this direction, towards the north, it extends 500 miles. Okay. Does that look like one river deposited that? Um, this is, covers an enormous area. Rivers deposit sediment in a belt right along the river. Doesn't look like that to me. Looks like something very different, far more catastrophic and, and enormous in scale. And that's just the beginning. Here's a, a map of something we call the Morrison Formation. Very colorful in these, in these layers that continue along the hills, you know, for miles. And not just a few miles. This is the extent of the Morrison Formation. From Canada down into New Mexico and all through this area, one and a half million square kilometers, 600,000 square miles, okay? And it's a, it's a uniform enough deposit that it's named as one formation. In fact, if you, if you scale that down to the size of a piece of paper, okay, so that whole thing is this thick, is this size, the formation would not be thicker than this paper. Okay, so how do you deposit something like that over 600,000 square miles? It's full of fossils, a lot of dinosaurs, etc. This is something very different from anything we see happening on the earth today. Uh, a very large scale um, process that just doesn't fit modern rivers. Here's, there's, and that's just one. Here's the Dakota, um, the Dakota Formation, 815,000 square kilometers. Chin Li, another colorful one, 300,000 square kilometers, and so on. There are just many of these. Modern processes don't begin to explain these. It's, it's something, it calls for something just radically different from what we see happening today. It's, Calls for something on a global, on a continental scale at least. Okay, what could that be? Well, uh, certainly not modern processes. And so we look again at these. I mean, how how widespread they are. So these are not. This is just a, looking at a very small part of these. They extend for hundreds of miles each way. What kind of a flood would do that? Nothing that we see happening today. So let's look at this in another way. If we, uh, if we take a, you get a big tractor and you cut a, a, a trench down through this and so we can see a cross section uh, through this, that's what we're going to look at next. And so here are all these rock layers, one above the other. And this is based on actual data from, from, from the western United States. And so this is a, a hundred miles here. So this is a couple of hundred miles across in the mountain area. And you have these layers that go just all the way through this area. And that's the way the lower two-thirds of the geologic column are. The geologic column is a series of rock deposits, one above the other. Um, and the lower two-thirds of that um, is like this. Now, on, in the, for geologists who accept the standard time scale, that's like, um, like, five, uh, like 400 million years. Yeah, 400 million years of time. But it's like this, okay? And it's not like small deposits formed by rivers. It's very different. Okay, now at the end of this, what we call the Mesozoic, two-thirds of the way up through this rock, these rock layers, now the Rocky Mountains form, and they bend this. Now you have basins, and you have new rocks forming much smaller area here in the basins. And then time goes on, there's more erosion shaping the landscape. And now what do we have? The modern processes are what's happening right here in these river valleys. Okay, I, I had to, to exaggerate the size of this for you to even see it. But does it look like this river here could have formed these? Not really. It takes something just radically different from that. And just, uh, I talked about this geologic column. You haven't been introduced to that. But here's, here's a diagram. Um, this is where you first find life in the rocks. That would have been early in the flood, I would suggest. And then 
You have the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the, all these rock layers and the animals found in them, and the Cenozoic. Okay, the, the lower two-thirds here are like this. But this is what's happening today. Things happening on a very small scale. So something radically uh, has changed. And so we look at these formations, and this is what I'm telling you so far is just the beginning. Okay, I'm looking at what happens here in the United States. But there was a, a, geolog a British geologist um, a few, several decades ago who spent his career deliberately traveling around the world and looking at the rock deposits around the world. What's it like in other places? Well, you can, he found that you can extend this uh, to a global scale. We have rock formations that you find here, and you find them in other parts of the world. Uh, you've probably heard of the White Cliffs of Dover in, in, in Britain. Well, okay, that's a certain kind of sedimentary deposit. It's actually uh, innumerable skeletons of tiny little organisms. And it, those, the White Cliffs had little, little black uh, flint rocks in it, certain kinds of fossils. Okay, you find that in Britain. You find it in the United States in places. You find it through Europe. You find it in Australia. Okay, why is this happening globally and all at the same level in that geologic column, the same time this is happening around the world. Um, coal beds, with the, there's, there are the enormous coal beds in the eastern United States. Okay, at that same level in the rocks, you find the same kind of coal beds um, in, in Europe, uh, in, in Russia, and in other parts of the world. Why, whatever it was, and coal is actually plant material. Masses of plant material have been preserved. Why is it so widespread? It doesn't look like anything that happens today. And this is a really interesting, something we call Triassic red beds. In one, one level in this geologic column, right about the middle, called the Triassic, there are characteristic red formations. Uh, you saw some of that earlier. Um, and there are red rocks in other places, but the, the Triassic has these very characteristic red beds, they're called. Okay, where do you find Triassic red beds? You find them in Western United States, Eastern United States, uh, Britain, through Europe, into Russia, and Australia, uh, in South America. And he, he told about being at a, at a geology meeting uh, where there are geologists from many places. And there was a geologist from South America showing pictures of rocks. And the geologists from China immediately recognized those as Triassic red beds. Okay, so at that time, uh, what I, I would say during the flood, why was what's happening in Australia, why isn't it, it being controlled by things that, that are you'd see in Australia? Why is it being controlled by the same thing as in Europe and in South America? Something global is happening. There's gl a global character to these rock layers. And, you know, he puzzled over this. He, he, he warned in his book, he warned creationists not to use this as evidence for what we think. Why did he feel he needed to do that? Because the evidence doesn't fit the way he thinks. It fits the way we think. And so he was nervous about what we would do with it. Well, I'm doing exactly what he warned us not to because it fits our understanding of Earth history it does not fit his understanding of Earth history. Something global was going on. We'll look at another line of evidence. Bedded sedimentary, sedimentary deposits. You see these, these layers, geologists call those layers or beds. So this is bedded rock. It has, it's in these layers. And you see these very prominent bedded rocks in many places. This is the limestone. Here's the Grand Canyon. Why are there such distinct beds and why are they preserved? And you'll see in a moment why I would ask that question. Uh, a colleague and I and some students have done, been doing several years of research on these bedded deposits. This is a very interesting one in Utah. Uh, it makes interesting work, places like this. But what we're doing is documenting the very, the detailed nature of these rocks in one formation after another. And you see all these layers so well preserved. Remember this is mud and sand that is deposited by water. All right, so you have, you, you, you're at the ocean, uh, currents are carrying this mud and sand and depositing it in layers, and what's happening? Well, what's happening right in front of you there 
is that creatures are burrowing into that sand and into that mud. Here's a little crab that's, um, that's burrowing. And they, they're burrowing through continually because they, they go through the mud and the sand and they get little organic particles out, which is their food. But they, when they're doing all these burrows, they're leaving things like this. These are fossilized burrows. And here he has some fossilized burrows down through the, through the rock. Okay, this is what happens today. In fact, people who study these, they're, 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 um, to understand this is important for understanding the rocks. And there are a lot of paleontologists who spend their career studying these burrows. Worm burrows. Who cares about worm burrows? Well, because they do something very important. They, as they burrow, they turn up the sand and mix it all up. And they destroy this la these layers that are in there. Uh, thank you for listening.